What is a destination? In its simplest iteration, it is a place, a physical place. And the destination organization is charged with representing that place to the rest of the world in order to inspire and realize inbound travel. Hello, and welcome to 2021. I'm David Peacock. This is the Future Tourism Podcast. In the work we're doing at the Future Tourism Group, we look at a destination through a couple specific lenses. There is indeed the physical destination, the one that we work with day in, day out, And there is the inevitable digital cyber, the online virtual representation of our destinations made up not only of the content we as DMOs develop, but also of the millions of digital touch points that exist from businesses, attractions and events and the people of that destination. We've reached that point many years ago now where the vast majority of people will experience our destination digitally instead of in person. So back to the question, what is the destination? My guests today uh, both contributed blogs on the concept of virtual destinations, the Future Tourism Group, back in 2020. 2020, yeah, I guess it's gone. 2020 is gone. Um, first up is Andreas Riesenborn. He's a senior director of research and advocacy at Destination International. His blog was literally entitled "What Is a Destination." Good morning, Andreas. How are you? Where are you? What's it like? Hey, Happy New Year, David. Uh, thank you for having me. Always. Uh, Welcome to join one of the best beards in the biz. Um, I doing well. We survived 2020. I'm glad to make it to 2021. Um, I'm located in my fair city of Frederick, Maryland, a little bit outside of DC and Leesburg and whatnot. All things considered, um, my destination is doing. I think states are doing fairly well. Uh, it's amazing what a competent government, uh, strong values related to that that type of stuff, and people willing to help their neighbors and others. Uh, what that does for a community, you know, facing a pandemic. So I, I consider myself extremely lucky for not only just where I live and choose to raise my family, but uh, those I'm surrounded with too. Thanks, Andreas. It is great to see you. And I, I did miss it. Happy New Year to you indeed. Um, Ed Tomasi is the co-founder of Subnation. Um, he's also works directly with destination marketing organizations around the world. He is the co-chair of the Greater Raleigh Esports Local Organizing Committee. Ed, you wrote a blog piece back in 2020, um, which was essentially, in its simplest form, how to becoming a thrive, how to become a thriving esports destination. Um, nice to see you. How are you? Where are you? What's it like? Yeah, great to see you too, David. Happy 21. Um, I guess we can refer to 2020 as that year uh, officially. Um, I'm call- I'm I'm uh, here in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. I've uh, been a resident of, of, the, of this uh, great area for, for over eight years. Um, and, uh, you know, we're just like many other uh, areas within, you know, the country and the world. Um, we're under, uh, you know, certain restrictions, um, you know, that being outdoor gatherings and indoor gatherings and, and social distancing. Um, but overall, you know, in the general, the area has been very proactive. Uh, in in really uh, taking health and wellness uh, front and center, uh, and I think that's reflective um, in you know the fact that uh, small businesses that were allowed to reopen have remained open um, for the for the most part. Um, the ones that that have been able to you know financially uh, again you know survive the uh, the wave and, and the storm here, but um, but for the for the most part uh, you know we're we're doing well and trending well. Well, listen, thanks for being here and Happy New Year to you and your family as well. Um, I want to dive right into the big question, which is is really what can we learn from digital destinations like Fortnite and online dating that will help us as destination organizations? But I will say in the past year, if that entire concept of the digital destination was its own entity was being debated, that's gone away in the world of COVID. In fact, you know, almost 100% of the people who experience our destination other than our locals right now are doing it online. So I'm, I'm gonna throw the question to you first, Andreas. What can we learn from digital destinations that will help us as destination organizations and why will it help us? What's, what's, the, what's the key there? So let, let's back it up to the broader question. You know, Part of my gig here is to kind of assess the lay of the land of issues and threats or opportunities that destination organization have. And you know, one, one of our big phrases here that we say all the time is that destinations have to compete and that's because we are competing at the world stage what 2020 has taught us is that that world stage has 
not only expanded this way, but also expanded up and down via, via not just physical manifestations, but virtual. Look at what we're, this conversation we are facilitating now. You know, we are each on our respective states, actually different country with, with you, David. Um, that sort of border of entry has been diminished now. And so our attention now is where destination organizations can now look to learn. Now, we used to say, okay, we're competing against other destinations physically, but now we're competing against the attention aspect of it. You know, the time we are spending right now under lockdown or whatnot is that key aspect. Um, you know, one of the things I, I thought we can point out was, you know, we are normalizing time spent either in places like, you know, I mentioned Fortnite in my article um, or online dating or other video applications where it's normalized that like, yeah, we just sign on to do those type of stuff. So I really thought desegregation sort of awaken and can learn from was that, you know, you not, you not only have to have a foot in that realm, but you also have to acknowledge that you are also competing with that attention. So the, the example I gave was with Fortnite in particular was, you know, Travis Scott did a concert there with 12 million people showed up. So if you were a destination organization, you say, hey, you know what, we're going to throw a book fair. I might second guess the calendar date if I'm like, okay, Fortnite's going to do another concert. Uh, we're competing against that. Let's move it the next day or the next week. The same way you look at like a convention calendar with meetings and events. You know, the point being was we have the skill sets to do this. We just have to expand our, our range of view. Like, you know, it's not just competing against these other cities and stuff. It's now it's like, well, other literally cities in the virtual realm. You know, what's going on in Fortnite is now just as important as what's going on with your competitors and your comp set. So yeah. our, our, our peer from Crowdrift, Dan Holowak, said it really well. And this was all the way back in, I think it was March, April. In the pandemic rules, um, literally almost every experience we have starts and ends digitally. It doesn't matter if it's ordering groceries, watching a movie online, or, or talking to your grandma on Skype. We're, we become attuned to the fact that everything we do has a digital aspect. Ed, that's not a surprise to you. You've been living in a world where people immerse themselves in, in digital environments, sometimes for days at a time. Um, you know, what is it, what is it we need to, to learn about how we create these digital environments, what they deliver? I mean, we, we've had sort of a push version of this in the past, you know, stories and billboards out, they go. You live in a world of digital that's far more immersive where people are interacting. What can we learn from, from eSports and, and then take that from wherever you want? Yeah, I think, you know, in the, in the early days of eSports and, you know, I've been involved with eSports for about 20 years um, and, you know, when we first started seeing live streaming coming onto the scene, you know, five or so years ago, uh, the one thing that um, we've noticed what we, we termed was this thing called, um, you know, viewership fatigue, right? And, uh, and, and it's basically uh, watching and continuing to watch large amounts of video content that really was the same format. And it might have been a different game in a different community, but the format was the same. And as we saw the industry grow and the production value grow of that content, we started seeing that there, was, there were you know, diff different levels of production. Uh, and you know, there, there's you know, certain things that communities demand, and there are certain things that uh, the, the communities uh, in the gaming world and and viewerships um, want it, want to keep the same, right? So th there's things that they that they want to consume in a certain way, and then there's there's op opportunities for the production group to sort of level up that production. And I, what I what I think I've seen as a trend is that this leveling up has diminished uh, viewership fatigue. But now that we've got so much content because everything is digital. Um, I feel that the destinations themselves need to, A, embrace digital, uh, as Andreas had, had mentioned earlier, um, but also look at how to differentiate themselves with production quality. It's no longer going to be sufficient for a destination to just ho host a Zoom call and, you know, have that Brady Bunch view. Um, you know, they're going to look for, the audience is going to look for, you know, different camera angles. So their eyes go to a different place on the screen, again, preventing this type of screen fatigue. So I think from a production perspective, destinations are going to have to quickly embrace and many have invested during the pandemic. And I think those destinations that have really taken this, this, 
you know, horrific opportunity, right, to, to really reinvent and reinvest in technology that allows them to be and to be viewed differently in different ways and platforms are the ones that are really going to succeed in 21 and beyond. Yeah, I, I say there, there's a great rallying cry there for destination organizations. You know, I started my 2020 with a letter from Comcast telling me that they are capping me and raising my rates. <laughs> you know, I, I play video games, I consume content, I do my job through this, this world right now, you know, it's no longer desertizations are no longer going to talk about you know how many feet they are away from a, a restaurant or whatnot. They're also going to talk about well, here's our down speed, here's our ping, you know that kind of stuff. This is the type of stuff that makes me want to move. You know, I hope desertizations you know start the rallying cry like, hey, maybe we should consider like a municipal fiber network so that we can better conduce people who want to play video games or esports or um, you know fight back against stuff like that so that we are competitive in adopting that technology that you're talking about, Ed. Yeah. So, so let, let's go back to just a, a key point, though, that Ed brought up, and I think you you highlighted it first, Andreas. Let's look at the production of the content. We we have in our mind a mindset of what we produce as destination content, and, it, and it's fairly expanded now. It's a, it's a lot like television. If you think, you know, you know, radio came along with the voice play, television took the voice play and turned it actually into, you know, the shows that we have today that are highly produced, destinations are catching up. They're producing television in the sort of way. Ed, esports is going beyond that, though. It's going immersive. And if I heard one thing as a, as a, as a subtext, what you're saying is it's the production game that we're going to have to up. When people experience a destination virtually, we are literally competing with their, with their ability to go off and watch a movie, listen to a great concert, or do something else. So how are we competing with our sort of TV era content, and we've we've got to up it in this immersive world. But let's go back to that Fortnite thing you talked about earlier, Andreas. Fortnite had never tried something before. They they held the live event, and Travis Scott's a, a huge Grammy Grammy nominated rapper. Um, that that event existed in the Fortnite world. It was real. It existed there. And if I if I understand the numbers correctly, there were more than twelve million people that attended that event. And when they attended, they didn't sit back in their seats like they were watching a concert. It was a little bit more like watching Ready Player One, where they were actually part of the action, weren't they? Yeah, I mean, it's the the traditional sense of going out to Fortnite is to go on and play the game. But these people just logged on to Fortnite to watch a concert. The same way I would go down to, you know, well, I could, my music hall or see venues, which I miss greatly, and, and interact with that. Um, that's a massive paradigm shift in the human condition, you know, that Fortnite in that sense is, is a platform, not, you know, platform towards the destination. The destination aspect was the concert, um, that opens the window when that paradigm shift is changes or that wall is broken down, that opens what else could happen in the virtual realm, you know, and we, we are seeing that in other aspects too, right? Education events, you know, our own stuff included, um, you know, you're already starting to see that paradigm have shifted and we have adopted as part of our, our like I said, the human condition. Um, that's why I said, you know, this is a new thing that we have to com compete with. But I also, I don't want to end on a downer with that. I want to also say we are very uniquely qualified to handle, to market, and to excel in this new space. So what's interesting about um, a shift in, in media, and, and we really are in a shift in media, literally the proliferation of, of Google Meets and Zoom calls has turned the screen experience into an interactive experience. If we weren't playing interactive games, if we weren't you know playing Rainbow Six and, and, and on our Xbox, certainly in the last eight months, we've all become interactive screen users where we participate. Ed, Gaming's been doing that for a while. In the pandemic, what happened to gaming destinations? Did they did they blow up? Did they explode? Did they morph? What have you seen? Well, I mean, if you can sort of define the term destination, I mean, is it is it a destiny an online destination where the community has been gathering, or is it are you talking about the physical destinations that had once hosted these larger scale or medium scale uh, type of esports events? Sure, I mean, sure. Let's talk about both then, because we, we, I have an idea what happened with the large scale physical events. Is I, I've been working with you on some esports stuff in Canada. Right. But let's talk about both of those things. What happened? 
I mean, from the physical sense, obviously it, it canceled or postponed uh, many, um, all, right? We'll just use the term all, right? Um, what we saw quickly though, is that we saw that the leagues and esports production and event organizers uh, quickly pivoted um, and the pandemic obviously accelerated this pivot uh, into more of the, the digital or hybrid space. So even in the middle of June, uh, we did see organizations that had what we called hybrid events. And I would say starting in June, we started to see these hybrid events where the production was done with social distance and, and health and safety um, concerns in mind, um, but there was no audience. The audience was all digital, right? And I believe this is going to be the trend for, I would say, at least the, the next at least six months where you're going to have this hybrid model. And then um, as, you know, we're all, op you know, uh, opening up and, and, and moving out of the, these, these phases of lockdown um, and safety, um, we're going to start seeing the comeback of, the, of, a, of a live audience and an, an event. Um, so that's kind of like the trend that we saw. The first hit, everything was canceled. A couple months later, there was a pivot in production. Certain ones looked to do hybrid events where just the players and or the production crew was there on site in a socially distanced, safe way. And then we're seeing more now, okay, um, you know, let's, how are we going to be moving to these live events? Because, uh, you know, as you mentioned, I do work with, with several uh, municipalities throughout um, uh, North America, and um, the, the calls are, are starting to, to come in on availability on physical dates for, for esports and gaming events. Um, I think on the, the, the digital front, um, you know, there, there was obviously a, a pivot in formats, right? Because uh, the formats of a live, uh, you know, IRL uh, event, physical event for the players and the audience uh, is, is a different timed format than it is for uh, a, a pure digital production, right? So there, there might be certain cuts and certain, um, you know, it might be spread over uh, more days or less days, uh, in fact, to give the production crew enough time to do post editing, for example. Um, so, you know, and we started seeing the, the use, the heavy use of, of newer technologies uh, in order to, again, up that production value so the viewership fatigue wouldn't be, um, you know, a, as, as strong. So, when, so you are saying that, that even in the digital realm in esports, you're seeing shifts in COVID as the pressure on the digital realm becomes greater because more people are there. Do you think we're going to see a more sophisticated, you know, digital um, eSport um, environment evolve out of this? I think eSports has always been on the cutting edge of technologies and incorporating them into production um, and, and incorporating them into games uh, and t incorporating them into distribution. Um, so, you know, the, the absolute answer is yes. Um, and I also feel that, uh, you know, the, the, the distribution component of it. And we talked about Travis Scott concert, which was, by the way, one of the second concerts that, that Fortnite did. The first one was with Marshmallow. And if you take a look at the Marshmallow concert that was in game the year prior, and you look at the production quality of the Travis Scott, you can actually side by side see the leveling up. Um, so I encourage everybody to, to take a look at that. Um, but from a distribution perspective, it's not just about having the game and watching it through your game. I myself, you know, I have a 16-year-old son who is uh, very much into Fortnite. Um, and it's not like I wanted to sit on the edge of his bed to watch the screen as he participated in it. He was like, Dad, get out of the room. I want to participate in this. So I went downstairs to my, my you know, uh, you know, my, my entertainment room and, and threw Twitch on, you know? So I watched it without having the game in myself and I was even immersed into it because of the music and the, and, and the, you know, the, the energy and, and the fact that those characters were people, you yeah, know? That's a, and, and, that's, and that's really interesting. Yeah. And so, your comment about the new technology, I mean, you haven't said it yet, but I mean, there, there's no other industry that is as equally prolific 
of the adoption of new technologies as video games. Well, there's actually two. If David, it's your show. I'm going to keep it PG. So you yeah, can figure out the other one. But yeah, video totally. games, <laughs> video games are, you know, the, the last 25 mm -hmm. years from experience to media distribution to storage, there is nothing as prolific as video games outside the other four letter industry. So, I mean, um, it, when you say that, it's like, yeah, of course they will. It's, it's one of those few industries that is like, it's very much always been malleable to adoption to new things. And we, we could honestly, from my side, we could learn a lot from that. You know, that yeah. like, no, that nothing is ever, the, there's nothing a plateau ever with that, with your, your industry, you know, that, that always adoption, keep pushing, keep understanding that the ground we sit on now will change again. Um, you know, we could learn a lot from that philosophy. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's scary. Uh, that's scary for brands and that's scary for destinations. And I see destinations as brands. Um, uh, but since our, you know, we're, we're talking about DMOs and, and destinations, you know, um, it, it's scary. And, you know, we here at Subnation are, are that guide, um, that, that allows them to understand quickly uh, the, the lay of the land, the scope of the market, uh, understand what the opportunities are and what, what really needs to be done at, that, at the level that the community is going to accept them as, as being authentic versus, you know, just jumping in and, and pretending to be esports ready. Right. So, so let me let me drill into that a bit. So I am excited, very excited by what you're both just talking about, this idea that one day all content, whether it's shopping or visiting a destination or esports, will be far more interactive. That day is coming. That's what I'm hearing in the leap motif there. But Ed, you just started down the other path, which is this. In your blog, you wrote very carefully about the idea of claiming um, the the sort of birthright to being an esports destination lay in having the actual DNA that made that possible. You can't go out and just say, hey, we're going to be esports tomorrow. We have no partners. We have no infrastructure. Our internet infrastructure is pretty crappy, but hey, we're going to do it. Now, you can do that if your intention is to build a strategy over years, but really it comes back to something that Andreas talks about all the time, which is this. A destination's DNA and a virtual reputation, virtual representation of that de destination must line up. If the destination, you know, on on uh, on digital, I used to, we would have said on paper in the past. If the destination in digital promises you something and you go and you can't experience that, that creates this tremendous cognitive dissonance that, in a review-based world, gets out really quickly. Andreas, when you look at the the digital representations of destinations, are you seeing that they are carefully curated to match the actual reality of the, dist of the destination? Or are we still prone to selling sizzle, not steak? You know, this is where I think the the, the true opportunity lies. And I, I've described this as basically the, the articles of, of transcendence, that destinationizations are going to have to start looking at new positions to handle that handoff, right? So to take a, a very traditional approach we do with sales and marketing, right? Okay, I need someone to represent the Midwest for under 800 MP corporate market, right? We could take that same approach and saying, all right, we now need someone who is in that digital realm who manages our uh, repu reputation, implementation, and brand exposure in that virtual realm. Um, I One of the things I've started to see, at least at the very early onset in decentralizations, is something as simple as, hey, you know what, before 10 years ago, we needed a social media person to do this. Now I'm seeing people saying, hey, I need a video production person who can maintain my YouTube channels, my Twitch channels, my live channels and whatnot um, as part of that. But it can go so much further, right? I can start seeing people saying, hey, you know, we have a skill set in, you know, uh, I'm going to say the word Alexa, apologize for people out there. I think just went off, you know, the Googles and that kind of stuff. We need someone there to be that steward, that shepherd for our representation there. So anywhere someone thinks of insert destination name here, we have a person of presence, boots on the ground who can manage it. That's the next, I mean, no pun intended here, the level up that we need to do um, to get there. I think Destinations are uniquely positioned to do it, but man, we can't squander this opportunity. You know, that's but, but, where we but, need to go. Let's drill into that question though about authenticity. Um, and and I'll, I'll I'll encapsulate it in this statement. Um, uh, talking about Fort Worth in in the pandemic, 
um, the observation w was made by uh, Next Factor that that destinations that had alignment with stakeholders fared better. <laughs> They fared better in the sense that the content they were able to create was authentic. It spoke about the destination. Because it spoke about what was really there, they were able to pivot that and serve the local market as well. Do you think we're going to see an increase in that authenticity and validation-oriented content versus you know, the, the beauty shots of, of beaches and streets? We Does it matter? We, we, we have to to survive. I mean, full stop. We, and we know, and there's tons of research on this, that whole brands compete better than fractured brands, full stop, right? And the, the cool thing about brands is that brands are one of the few things that transcend physical and virtual, you know? We have to enter that realm. Like, there, there's no like, yeah, let's maybe put a toe in it. No, 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 no. We have to do that to survive. That is the only way that we as our, our, our sector can survive this. You know, I, that's what I said. I would compliment the video game industry. They've they've known that. This is part of their ethos. We need to take that as part of our ethos to to transcend that. And there are lots of destinations who have adopted what a whole brand means to them, and have, and and the results show not just economically but cultural, socially, and my most important currency, which is talent acquisition, new residents. You know, once you compete against those things, that's where it really starts to show. But yeah, they're full stop. We have to enter those things like we will not survive this if we don't well and that whole brand is a good place to throw back to you ed and just talk about that that um that, and we, we would do a disservice in in this episode not to talk about how to be an esports uh, destination since you're here and i don't want to squander the opportunity of being here so you've talked about um, a destination creating an illustrated proven commitment to innovation, activating and nurturing relationships, um, the messaging that needs to be sent out there. Talk about the ideal esports destination development then. And if you, if you want to use one of your existing projects like, like a Raleigh or somewhere, please go ahead. Absolutely. Um, so I would just say that the key to this is building partnerships and not looking for transactional relationships. Um, that That is sort of the uh, the baseline, right? And if, if you're out there as a destination and there's, there's many that are out there and that's, that's what they know and what they, they, they've been good at doing, um, you know, prior to all of this and it was working, it's no longer going to always work as a transaction. So as, as you approach groups within esports, there, there's, uh, there's an action and a reaction. There's no longer just a one way. And we used to use this term back in the day in marketing called the push marketing component, right? You know, there, it's truly interactive. It's truly experiential, you know? And so Defining those for a DMO as it relates to being an attractive market to bring in esports programming, um, there's a lot of different areas and things that you need to touch upon. You know, number one is is do you do you yourself as a destination have a strategy that includes partnering with local groups that are part of the core infrastructure for esports events, internet, power. Um, security, health and wellness, um, housing, transportation, entertainment, food. Um, I mean, the, the list goes on and on, but you have a list of those as a destination. Every destination has that list. They maybe even have members, right, um, that have, have paid into it and are even more, um, uh, you know, active in, in, uh, in, in, in being involved with the process of bringing in groups. Um, but when you present that to esports organizers, it's it's a different chapter that they look at, you know, and they want to understand that, uh, you know, is it a, a union friendly uh, facility or is it a union friendly town? Um, do you have a, a deal with, uh, you know, the life the lifebloods of our events, which are internet and power? Um, you know, is it um, it is it uh, a community where if I announce my event, it's not going to be an eyebrow lifting, it's going to be eyes wide open excitement. I want to go to that event. I can't wait till they come. Right. And those are the those are the things that that need to be communicated by DMOs um, because a lot of them have these elements and components in communities. And they're just, you know, I think finding it now um, mandatory and 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 for them it's a little bit frightening 
um, to to really go at and try to put that all together in a video, in content, in communication back to the you know the gaming and esports industry. So again, you know these are challenges that that everyone is facing. Um, there are destinations that have uh, you know re invested or 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 they've shifted their investments within their marketing mix to include uh, this content, not just social, but interactive social and, and, and perhaps, uh, you know, building websites that are, that are core to uh, communicating all those, those vital pieces of information uh, that esports and gaming uh, organizers look for. Uh, and, and again, building the partnerships versus going out there and trying to find the transaction. So, Andreas, isn't it interesting that when Ed talks about identifying eSport ready destinations and building it, there's no question in his mind that he's looking for a holistic representation of that destination. Does it have all of these things? Um, I think we aspire to that in tourism. Sometimes it's easier to to focus on our key demand generators and forget the rest of the city. But what do you say to that whole idea of a holistic gener a holistic destination? You already touched on when you said, you know, whole brands do better than partial brands. Are we there or are we making that transition? What kind of work are we doing on that front? I mean, I, I said my early rallying cry, the stuff that you outlined, those other common goods, power, internet, you know, uh, uh, food and beverage and stuff like that. Um, we have to take that up as part of our mantle as things that we advocate for in the same way we market the, the, the very convention center stuff to do that. Um, I think that is new territory for a destination organization, right? I think these are the, the thing, here's the funny thing, right? Those things that, Ed, that you're talking about that make a good esports thing, guess what? They also make good things as a resident, you know? So like as a destination organization, I, I two birds with one stone, I win in both. Right. If I advocate for those things in my destination, I also I get the opportunity to maybe gain a 30 to 50,000 event. But maybe I could possibly add millions of new residents the same way who are also looking for the same thing. And furthermore, um, th those I'm assuming Ed, please correct me, but I'm assuming the median age of those individuals is probably relatively young. Right. So they're, maybe they haven't entered their realm of buying a house finding where they might settle down and stuff like that. We know this, that you get someone into your destination once, there's a better chance of them returning. Think of that opportunity. You know, you have the opportunity of maybe a typical esports events of 30 to 50 to 100,000 people new coming to your destination who think, wow, you know, maybe I really like, you know, uh, uh, you know, Charlotte or Seattle or any insert destination here that mm -hmm. say, you know what, this is a great place. Maybe I'll come back and live here, you know, and, you know, take it a step further, raise a family, et cetera, et cetera. That is where the, the real cool opportunity is. Yeah. So, I mean, so, it, sorry, go ahead, ahead please. I was no, saying, please. you know, the, the, what, what I think is, is surprising to most um, when I have conversations, so I do get, I do get asked questions by destinations, whether they're evaluating um, our, our advisory services or they're deep into it um, is, you know, whether or not uh, this is targeted just towards the younger audience. And, and my answer is, you know, no. And the, and the reason why is like, if you think about one of the most, the, the, the world's, one of the world's most popular esports titles is Counter-Strike. Counter-Strike is a title that's over 20 years old. So if you think about the players over 20 years ago and what age they're at now, right? Just for that one game, Counter Strike, right? Um, you look at all the other games that titles that are out there, or the platforms that are out there. We're now on PlayStation 5, right? Uh, what about the 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 players and the community that that was playing on the on the original PlayStation? They're not young, <laughs> yeah. um, and and so you know without without going into that. Um, as the years go by, the the age range for esports and and gaming content consumption grows with it. So, so let's let's just uh, as we wrap up, let's talk about one thing here, and I think you both hit on it, and it's really really important. Ed, I've been working with you a bit, as I said, in in the states and in Canada. Um, there's no question that in your model, engaging the local community to articulate the benefit 
of esport is a huge component of what you do. And I and I think of the work you do in in Ontario, where the the event facilities, the city infrastructure facilities, the IS. P's, the universities are all on board because they see it as an extension of their own being. And Andreas, I think of the work you do so ardently day in, day out to get destinations to advocate to their own citizenry about the benefit of tourism. Those are completely parallel situations. Um, talk to that for me, please, if you would. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, like I said, my fundamental belief is that, you know, I believe destination promotion is a common good for the greater good. It is in the same line of thought as we talk about clean water, education, transportation, um, and, and safety. In the same vein, I think the next common good is an additional infrastructure, which is a lot of stuff Ed has been talking about that we need to be esports ready, which is the prolification of you know uh, available, you know fair, um, you know net neutral internet access, like you know full stop. And um, I see that in parallel that desegregationists who are also trying to articulate themselves as common good can join that ra same rallying cry. And a, a huge benefit of that would be, you know, not just us as we do our jobs, but that procurement of that that new type of potentially visitor, which could be an esports related visitor. Okay, lightning round. We're gonna we're gonna close it out here. Um, observations that we've made today that we want to share, and I'll, I'll I'll go first. The big one for me is this. You know what? Content is still king, and the the consumer the consumer is a sophisticated uh, being, and they will seek out, seek out the best content that that informs and entertains and entertains them. They always have, and they will continue to do that. And that's got big implications for our destination organizations as they send out their messaging and they tell their stories. Over to you, Andreas. One thought. I would say I agree. I mean, I was trying to think of a better way to, to, to paraphrase that, what, but um, I just, I think I want to end on a positive, just understand for desegregations, you know, we are uniquely qualified for this shift. You no know, other industry has the capability of brand management, you know, visitor experience, guest experience, and, all, and furthermore, resident experience like us, you know, we are uniquely qualified for this next normal. Um, and I think hearing stuff like Ed's talking about and what that future brings is exciting, you know, and we should be at that front of that table being his best champion for that sector in particular, because it adds a huge realm of quality of place for our destinations, which will influence quality of life. And then final word to you, Ed, you are the guy who's working in the virtual destination that in Andreas's words is one of the most developed in the world spend more time in virtual than anywhere else any parting thoughts for our our peers in the tourism industry yeah i think you know the, the, to know that destination the dna of of a destination uh it it, it doesn't change it it shifts uh with with the, the the audience and the technology but it doesn't change so you know you talk about wanting to be authentic in the space don't ever change your the dna that makes you great as a destination um the the second thing is that every destination has something to offer while every destination doesn't have may not have the ability or ever have the ability of hosting uh you know a, a, a massive blizzard event or a riot games event or an esl one event um and some of these large arena blasting laser focus type of thing um every destination um can be hosting esports and it and the, it starts with with what's in their community um and you know one of one of the things i'll, I'll leave with is uh I have, I have several conversations with uh i guess what would be considered tier two and tier three cities um and i i, I always encourage them to pick up the phone and try to reach out to their local uh gaming clubs, uh, their local GameStop, because a lot of the folks there are, are really tied in and have the finger on the pulse of what's in their market. And I think they start having those conversations and not being afraid of starting those conversations is, is just a, a great way to start the new year. Well, guys, it's been it's been great to speak to both of you. I thoroughly enjoyed both the blogs. I think I enjoyed this even more. Um, I hope to have you back in the new year. Have a great day. Thanks for being here.